Hi there, I'm Firelight. I am the author of the new book, The Dabbler's Guide to Witchcraft, and the host of the podcast, Inciting a Riot. Thank you all so much for being here today. So today, I want to talk about a concept from my book called Spell Canvases. Uh, so like I said, I wrote a book, The Dabbler's Guide to Witchcraft, and in the back of that book, like a lot of books on witchcraft and magic and pagan spirituality, I also included a spell section, but I included a section that I called spell canvases. Spell canvases are sort of my reinterpretation of a spells section. There are a lot less spells in here than you might normally see in an introductory book on witchcraft. And that's because I want to encourage the reader to take a spell and then change it to whatever they need it to be. So basically, uh, in a spell canvas, I give you um, a setup for a ritual. Sometimes it's basically a kid's science experiment. Sometimes it's a little bit of a, a trick or something. <laughs> Uh, but basically, I, I give you an outline of something that you could do, something that you could incorporate into your daily life, and then I show you two or three different ways that you can adapt it to be a spell. And I do that because, you know, I've been practicing and studying for <clears throat> 20 years <laughs> at this point, and what I've often found when I'm reading a book on magic or pagan spirituality or something like that, and I get to the spell section, is, you know, I, I get to, <laughs> I go and I get to the spell that I want, and there's an ingredient that I don't have, or I'm in the wrong moon phase, or something like that, and I think, well, yeah, can I just not do the magic? <laughs> And the thing is, you know, I'm sure that you're out there chuckling because when you've been doing this a really long time, what you find out is that if you need to do magic, you can just do magic with whatever you have on hand. You don't have to wait for a particular moon phase. You don't have to uh, wait to find a particular ingredient. I distinctly remember uh, earlier on in my path, um, I wanted a spell to stop gossip. And at the time, I was sort of um, limited in what I'd read. <laughs> I wanted a spell to stop gossip. And so I, I, did, I did my due diligence and I flipped open, I think, my Cunningham's Encyclopedia of Magical Herbs. And I did a lot, a lot of us do, you know, you open the book, you flip to the back of the book, you go into the correspondences section and you search by, you know, intention. Okay, gossip, gossip. And I remember the only one that I could find in there, the only entry was for Slippery Elm. I had no idea what Slippery Elm was. Uh, I, I looked it up. Um, it was really hard to find. Uh, I could not find it in my grocery store. Uh, later on, I found, um, I, I think it was in some kind of lozenge maybe, I'm, I'm not, quite sure. But, but the I remember finally finding it at a witchy shop, like an hour away from my house. And it was in this little bag. And I kept this little bag forever, just in case I ever ran out <laughs> of, uh, of, of Slippery Elm and I needed to stop some gossip. Oh my gosh, what are you going to do? And I think that's kind of one of the reasons why so many witchy people end up becoming mild hoarders. Because we, you know, we, we go out and we start collecting the dried herbs and we start collecting all the crystals and we start collecting and collecting and collecting and think, you know, I'm going to use this one day. <laughs> I can never let this go. I might need it. Completely forgetting the fact that eventually if you hold on to a dried plant long enough, the only thing that you have in that bag or that jar is dust. <laughs> dust. That if a, a plant that if you look at it wrong, is going to collapse into dust. Um, you don't have a plant anymore. Whatever was in that plant is long gone. And the thing is, sometimes the plant isn't in season. Sometimes the crystal is hard to find. Sometimes the recommendation from the book is a little difficult. And that can be intimidating for someone. That can be um, a little bit of a, a letdown, a setback for a new dabbler who wants to make magic or even an experienced you know, an experienced practitioner uh, that that is, you know, that feels like they know their stuff, but then you get to the book and you want to do the thing and the, 
you don't have the ingredients. And, you know, we're currently living through a pandemic. There's a lot of uh, economic and social insecurity. And, you know, opening the book and finding that you're missing ingredients, suddenly you're having to do the calculus of, do I need to go buy something? Do, do I Do I need to go... How much money is this going to be? How much money is this going to cost me? And if you're on some kind of fixed income or you're on a limited budget or, you know, you're in the midst of a heat wave or a flood or a fire or, <laughs> you know, around the Chicagoland area, uh, if you're in the middle of a blizzard, going out and getting something might just be prohibited by the elements themselves. And I know some of you in the audience are probably saying, well, fire light that you have to go and sometimes you have to sacrifice to get the magic and i get that however i also believe that witches are resourceful people and that we can and should make magic with whatever we have on hand uh you know uh, when you think about the tools of the witch you think about the cauldron uh, you know, that big giant cast iron pot and we've kind of turned it into this big thing, right? You know, we've turned it into this, this magical implement because it, it comes to us from the annals of history and it's so wrapped up in the iconography of the witch that a cauldron in and of itself just feels like this otherworldly mystical thing, but it was just a cooking pot. <laughs> it was just what everybody had to cook with. It is what you had to cook with. Um, you know, a broom was what you swept with. I, I, you know, the, the tools of the witch that we think of as the tools of the witch were just the things that people had on hand, mostly people that had to do things for themselves. Uh, you know, people that had to be self-sufficient, people that couldn't afford help, like most of us. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I think of those things and I try to think of like being a modern witch, I, I always think of like, okay, well, what does that look like now? Do I need that? Now? Do I need to go out now? Going out and buying a giant cast iron pot is sometimes a little bit of a luxury. They can be expensive. Um, you know, they can be large. If you're in a, a limited space, it can take up a lot of room. You know, in, in the book, I talk about a lot of alternatives that you could use. You know, a coffee pot instead of a cauldron could, could do double duty. Uh, you know, glass cookware, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we, there's a lot of ways that we can take you know, modern tools and modern ways of doing things and incorporate magic into them. So all of that said, uh, today I want to introduce you all to the concept of a spell canvas, which is probably something that you have already done yourself. Uh, if you've ever taken, you know, a let's take a love spell and you need a red candle and I don't know, a red thread and you need a some cinnamon or something like that, uh, you know, and and you do something with the thread. Maybe you tie it around the cinnamon stick and you light it on fire. You seal it in wax or something. I don't know. I'm coming up uh, with a, a basic love spell or passion spell or something off the top of my head. But let's say that you're just happen to be missing something. Cinnamon is one of those things that I sort of always assume I have on hand. And if I get home and realize oh crap, I'm out of cinnamon. <laughs> I'm not going back to the store. If I go to the store and I think, oh, you know what? I need, I need stuff for food, but I also need to do that spell that I've been meaning to do. And they get the ingredients. Oh, you know what? I think I have cinnamon at home. I get home. I realize I don't have the cinnamon. I am not going back to the store for the one thing. I'm sorry. I'm not doing it. It's not happening. But I can find a replacement for the cinnamon. I can adapt my spell to not need the cinnamon. I can adapt it to use something else. Um, why? Because there's a lot of things that can replace the cinnamon in a spell. There's a lot of things that could replace the thread in the spell. There's a lot of things that could replace the candle in the spell. Once you kind of understand the basics of how magic works and how the different components of spellcraft come together, you can take and, and rearrange a spell to incorporate what you have on hand, save yourself time, save yourself money, and get your magic done and out of the way. So 
Uh, I want to introduce you all to a few examples of spell canvases from my book, The Dabbler's Guide to Witchcraft, that I hope will be helpful to you. Um, I do want to kind of put up front. So when I designed a lot of these spell canvases, I took inspiration from, uh, you know, science experiments I did as a kid, uh, not quite magic tricks, but just sort of uh, tricks of, of uh, science or, or things that are, are incorporated into illusion. And I did that for a very specific reason, because I think that we need to embrace <laughs> the fact that sometimes witchcraft looks silly. And I think we need to be okay with that. And also I think sometimes we need to allow space for magic to inspire a sense of wonder, a sense of childlike uh, imagination and wonder in us. Because to me, that is the place from which effective magic is made. You know, that, that special combination of need and knowing and want and desire and really getting into the act of the spell, the energy of your working and putting your entire self into that magic. Having something literally fly into the air or poof up into smoke or have snow conjure in a bowl in front of you, these are things that to me put me and put me in and keep me in the headspace for effective magic because it, it keeps me in that place of wonder. It keeps me in that liminal space. Uh, it, it sparks that teeny tiny little thing in the back of my brain that's still like an eight-year-old boy that firmly and fully believes that one day I'm going to hop on a broom and I'm going to fly into the air. And I know none of us are going to hop on a broom and fly in the air, but it is okay to inject a sense of play and a sense of wonder and a sense of silliness back into your magic. Because life is too serious and you're never going to get out alive. <laughs> I think too often we get really hung up on needing our magic to be serious. You know, we want it to be really, really serious because we, you know, as Thorn Mooney would say, Thorn Mooney, author of The Witch's Path, uh, would say, you know, I'm doing serious work. We're doing serious work when we're doing magic. You know, she's talking about how uh, I had a conversation with her on my podcast recently, and she said, you know, so so many of us um, get really poo-poo on uh, newbies or fluffier people or something like that, um, you know, I, to, to use the pejorative, uh, because a lot of those folks tend to want sort of the more miraculous, the more magical look of uh, of magic or they they want the silliness thing the, the sillier looking magic and they dress up in costumes and things like that and folks that have been on their path a long time you know do a lot of poo-pooing on that oh i can't do that oh that's too silly don't make a mockery of my craft and the thing that i think that um those of us that have been here a while need to remember is that nobody's making a mockery of things it's just you know it's we're sitting in a room surrounded by candles saying words and kind of talking to ourselves and it, it's, it looks silly sometimes what we do. We're dancing around a fire and we're, you know, we're putting things on our faces and wearing masks or, or holding a magical stick and waving around a magical stick. And you know what? It is okay. It's okay to feel a little silly, but embrace that embrace it and make it part of the magic. I promise that once you do, you are going to unlock effective spellcraft like you've never seen. I, I promise when you can get out of your own way of feeling slight embarrassment for doing a thing, uh, the the effectiveness of your magic will grow exponentially um, because you will be a lot more present in the act itself. So today I'm going to walk you through three examples from the book uh, that I'm going to show you how to manipulate in multiple ways. So I'm excited for you to be here and I will meet you in my kitchen. Hi there everybody and welcome to my kitchen. <laughs> uh, so the first spell that I'm going to show you is something that I saw a few years ago on a viral science uh, video, science experiment video, and I immediately thought well that's magic. <laughs> 
Um, and like I said, a, a lot of the the things that I'm going to show you today um, come from either child science experiments, you know, stuff that's sort of made to to get kids interested in science, um, or or things that I just remember from my childhood that made me feel magical. Because I I personally think that if you can reignite that sort of feeling of magic, that childlike feeling of magic inside of you, that that's sort of the space that will help you create effective magic. So uh, in the spirit of, like I said, uh, I wanted to try and create um, spell canvases that used things that most people, I thought at least, would have on hand already. So the first one that I'm gonna show you is something that I call the flying tea bag. Don't laugh. <laughs> um, but it involves cheap tea bags. Um, I bought the fancier cheap tea bags from Aldi uh, because I really wanted some chai tea. But normally when I'm doing this, I keep a stock of just like green tea bag, like, you know, 60 for $2 or something just from the bottom shelf of whatever, you know, go to the Dollar Tree get yourself some cheap tea bags. It doesn't really matter the kind of tea. It doesn't really matter the brand of tea. Um, the only thing that really matters here is that you have a tea bag that looks like this with either the staple or something on top, basically that when you unfold it, it's hollow in the middle, um, that when you unfold it, you get a tube. I recommend choosing a tea that maybe corresponds to the kind of work that you want to do. So if you are um, wanting to do a spell of release, if you're doing a spell of banishment or something like that, maybe choose a tea that sort of reminds you of or, or brings to mind feelings of or correspondences for purification, cleansing, um, reaffirming of self, that kind of thing, self-healing. Uh, choose, choose a tea like that. Um, but again, don't go out of your way to buy something expensive or pricey. Cheap is fine. Cheap is totally fine. Uh, the only other things that you're going to need other than your cheap tea bag are some scissors, a lighter, and a pen. <laughs> I have great hand-eye coordination. <laughs> so uh, let me show you what I'm about to do. Okay, so let's say that I want to, I've been carrying around a lot of sadness and I want to get rid of the feeling of sadness. The first iteration of the first spell, it's called the Flying Tea Bag, um, and it's a version of the spell that is a, a spell of banishment. I'm getting rid of something. Um, and in this case, I want to get rid of a feeling of sadness. So in addition to maybe talking to a trusted friend, or if I have access to a therapist, maybe talking to a therapist, maybe I want to take a magical action. Um, and I want to do the flying tea bag spell. So all I do is I take my tea bag, uh, my scissors, my lighter, and my pen. So you want to make sure that up here at the top of the bag, you cut a really straight line. You want this to be pretty flat on the surface. Um, because it is going to fly into the air, but in order to do that, you kind of have to create a vacuum. So you're gonna cut that as straight across as you can and save the tea for later because we can drink that. Now I recommend um, if you're doing a, uh, this spell, choose a tea that aligns with your purpose as much as a tea can align with your purpose. So if you're uh, wanting to get rid of sadness, maybe you incorporate a tea that reminds you of joy. Because after you do this, the, the tea bag part, part is the actual banishment. Um, you can drink the tea afterwards to sort of fill you back up with a different energy. So if you are getting rid of sadness, maybe you want to drink some joy. Uh, so maybe drink a nice fruity tea or, uh, you know, a, a, a mint tea or something like that. Something that uh, whatever to you is the opposite of sadness. So anyways, um, I cut my tea bag, and all I'm going to do is write on the tea bag the thing that I want to get rid of. In this case, sadness. Okay. So I take my tea bag and I open it up 
into a cone. And I make sure it's standing as good as I can. We don't want a lot of air coming into the bottom. And then all you do, you can speak words of power, you can chant, you can sing, you can scream if you want, you can meditate for a minute, go within and just sort of let that energy go out that you're wanting to banish and then light the top on fire. And hopefully at the end, it does that and flies into the air. It might not fly into the air if uh, the bottom of the bag hasn't been cut flat, or I don't know if it's windy or something like that. Uh, some people that see this spell um, want to try to make some kind of grand meaning out of the bag not flying. Um, I don't ascribe to that. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that it's a sign any more than it's just, you know, bad airflow. Um, but, you know, if you feel that it's a sign, maybe that's your UPG and that's something that uh, you can analyze later. Now, another version of this spell is perfect for the Samhain season, the Samhain spooky season. So, uh, in a lot of cultures around the world, we write letters to the beloved dead and we tend to uh, throw those letters into bonfires or uh, send them through a candle flame or something like that. And in a lot of practices around the world and in a lot of um, uh, different kinds of cultures, um, fire is used as a way to transition a message from this world to the next. And you can do that with the flying tea bag. And I like that because if you don't have <laughs> access to uh, a bonfire or <laughs> <laughs> something like that, um, this is a really good alternative. And as you saw, there's not much mess afterwards and not a huge fire hazard. So if you're an apartment or something like that, this could be a pretty uh, good alternative for you. So again, you take your tea bag. We're going to cut it nice and straight across. Now, in this instance, maybe you choose a tea that was a favorite of your loved one. Maybe you choose a tea um, that you shared together. Maybe you choose a tea that gives you joy. Maybe you choose a tea that reminds you of fall. Maybe just choose your favorite tea. doesn't really matter. It's up to you. You make the correspondence. It's your spell. You are making the magic. So you're taking your tea bag and let's just you know, there's quite a lot of real estate here. Uh, you can use the front, you can use the back. You can write really small. My husband has written really small letters on these before and gotten quite a lot of real estate out of a single tea bag. For the uh, purposes of demonstration, let's just say, Dear Aunt Sally, hope you're well. Love ya. I do not have an Aunt Sally. <laughs> okay, but once again, uh, this would be a great time to speak your letter out loud, to communicate with dead Aunt Sally, um, you know, to, to speak these things out loud, uh, to maybe consider your grief, to maybe consider what this person meant to you, um, how they have impacted your life, uh, you know, kind of go within, um, you know, maybe play a song that was a favorite of theirs. Again, make, th this is a really simple ritual uh, format. It, it, it's a tea bag, a lighter, a pair of scissors, a pen. Um, there's not a lot to the mechanics of this. You can add as much ritual as you want. You can make as much of a meal out of this as you want. You can add a lot of extra words. You can add prayers. You could do multiple tea bags. Um, I will tell you, as far as the tea bag goes, you do want the pretty cheap ones. <laughs> you don't want like a silk tea bag. Uh, you don't. You don't want a really long tea bag or anything like that. You do want just kind of the cheap old tea bags. They they tend to work the best. But anyways, so once again, you're going to light it on fire and wish dear Aunt Sally a happy Halloween. Oh, oh, that got a little... It, it started picking up. <laughs> the air started picking up there in the middle of it, uh, and then it couldn't finish burning. I guess dear Aunt Sally didn't want to hear from us. Oh. 
I hope that was fun. <laughs> um, the next spell that we're going to do um, involves something that a lot of us here in Chicago know quite well, snow. But you don't always have access to snow. And that's where instant snow comes in. <laughs> if you are a teacher uh, or you're a parent of a kid that likes a lot of uh, sensory toys, this is probably not new to you. Um, but, uh, or if you're somebody that makes slime, when I was ordering this online, apparently this is big with um, people that like slime. So I'm sure the algorithm is going to attack me with slime videos now. Anyway. Um, so uh, this is a spell where we are going to conjure up some snow in the middle of our kitchens, which I personally think is pretty dadgum witchy. Uh, so I'm going to show you two different uses for instant snow. Again, if you're a parent, if you're a teacher, this might be something you already have. I will say out of all of the, there's 11 spell canvases in uh, my book. I'm only showing you three of them today. Uh, this is the one that will probably cost you money. Um, it, it's the only one that you can't, uh, you probably don't readily have on hand. <laughs> um, but I will tell you, I bought this online at on Amazon, um, and this was $5 for this. Uh, and this makes two gallons of snow if you really, really, really wanted it. You do not need very much of this. So if you're using this, if you're buying this for spells, this is going to last you a really long time. Uh, it's actually called sodium polyacrylate. That's that's the actual substance that it is. Uh, so if you go to Amazon or if you just Google search sodium poly polyacrylate or instant snow, uh, you'll find it. So let's get to it. So like our tea bag spell, this uh, ritual, this spell canvas also doesn't use a lot of ingredients. Um, like I said, the, the most expensive, most difficult one to find would be the instant snow, that sodium polyacrylate. Um, but once you find it, uh, once you get it online or you go to a teacher store, um, some like craft stores are struggling to have it as a sensory toy, that kind of thing, or in slime kits. Um, once you have that, that's, that's pretty easy. The only other thing you're going to need is a bowl, a little bit of water, very, very, very little water, um, a pen, and a piece of paper. Uh, the first one that we're going to do is what I call a snow day spell. So in the first version of this spell canvas, um, I am, <laughs> I'm doing a good thing. <laughs> so you have to understand that where I grew up, uh, I grew up in Texas, um, and, <laughs> and <laughs> snow days for me as a child were fun things. They were fun, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, I, they they were rare. They uh, they were enjoyable. They were a day out of school. Um, they were fun. Uh, I I realize that telling anyone around Chicago to think of snow as something joyful, um, I'm going to get smacked in the face. But I just want you to put yourself back in the headspace of when you were a kid uh, and thinking of those magical days when you were out of school and had no responsibilities and you just could run outside and be in the snow. That's what we're going to do first. So the first version of this is a snow day spell. And basically, you're either uh, writing your name or the name of uh, someone that could maybe use a little pick-me-up. And you are going to give them the feeling or give yourself the feeling of a snow day. That sort of, uh, you know, covered in white, joy, the world is made new, um, that kind of thing. So let's just say, uh, we're just gonna just say hi, um, John, for John Smith. Smith. So we are writing John Smith. John, if you're out there, the spell's for you and only for you. See, I'm not kidding. This spell is for John Smith. Um, <laughs> so we are just gonna fold up John Smith's little name. We are gonna say our words of power. We are going to sing. We are going to chant. We are going to do our witchy stuff, whatever. And then we're gonna add a little bit of water and say hello to the fly that decided to show up. And then we're gonna open up our sodium polyacrylate And we're just going to take a little bit, just a little bit, and we're going to sprinkle it 
into our water. Now this becomes snow. You can already kind of see that it is soaking up all that water. And turning from water into a gel and then turning into snow. And as we continue to add our little white powder again, we are dusting our snow. and it's becoming snow. If you let it set for quite a while and you add even more snow, it will become more and more powdery. But as you can see, we are already getting it to look nice and powdery like a nice snow day. Now, the next version of this is, let's say, we are not fans of John Smith. Let's just say John Smith doesn't like snow. Or maybe we want to give him the feeling of maybe some of that Chicago snow sometime in like February after it's been sitting there for a while. So the mechanics of all of that are the same, but we are going to add one extra ingredient. Pepper. <laughs> So I have my little fox pepper shaker here. Um, now you can do this with whatever you want. You can do this with dirt. You could do this with, go outside. I mean, really get into this. Go outside, get under your tires. I mean, you could really like correspondence. See, it's already getting real fluffy. Um, you could really kind of get into the correspondences here and go get dirt from, uh, I'll show you the, the nice pretty snow before we do the bad thing to it. So this is what the sodium polyacrylate looks like after you've added enough and let it sit in water for a while, you get that nice pretty fluffy snow. But again, let's just say that John Smith, we don't like John Smith. <laughs> Uh, and we are not fans of John Smith. So let's go get some dirt from our tires. Let's go get some spices. Let's go get some whatever. Me personally, I use black pepper. And I put his name down. I put him in the bowl. I cover him in the water. Maybe I use other things other than water. I don't know. If you have a fluid that you can think of that, <laughs> that is water-based, that you would like to use in the spell. I think we all know what we're thinking of. Um, if you want to pee in the bowl. I'm saying, do you want to pee in the bowl? You can pee in the bowl if you want. But anyways, let's add our black pepper and let's give John the snow day from February here in Chicagoland. And we are thinking the dirt, the dirty black snow that you see in the parking lot at Target after it's been piled up there for weeks and we're going to get our hands dirty and we are just going to shake John up in that feeling of that dirty black piled on snow. So there's two ways of doing the spell. One inspires joy, one inspires that sense of just, ugh. Now, if you are someone that only ever wants to do positive magic, cool, fine, whatever. I am just showing you an alternative, um, multiple ways of doing the same spell. By now, you've probably realized that I uh, like to be pretty resourceful in my ingredients for effective spellcraft. And I also like to have a little fun. Um, now, one, the, the last spell canvas that I want to show you <clears throat> very much came out of necessity. You want to talk about things that we have on hand. Uh, this one is something that all of us have on hand right now, and it's hand sanitizer. Um, <laughs> and we are living in a pandemic. Everyone has their hand sanitizer with them at all times in little bottles, in big bottles, in spray bottles, in, in all sorts of things. So I thought that I would include a way that you could maybe use some of this hand sanitizer in making effective magic. Now, I will tell you, when you are getting uh, hand sanitizer, if you want to do some of the spell canvases from the book, I recommend 
the cheap, well, again, just the cheapest. This cost me less than a dollar. Um, the cheap models with the squeezy top on top. You want something like that because you're going to use it to draw with here in a minute. Uh, so I'm going to show you a few different ways to use hand sanitizer to get different magical results. So the two different versions of the spell that I want to show you involve pretty much the same mechanic. Um, you are going to uh, get something that's pretty heat protectant. I'm using just a, a silicone cutting board. Here's some ASMR for you. Um, something that's pretty heat resistant. Uh, I You can do it right on the countertop, but you might have some scorch, bur uh, scorch marks. Um, but you are going to be lighting this on fire. So we need our lighter again. I'm going to go... So again, the basics of the spell are pretty simple. You're going to take the hand sanitizer, you're going to put the hand sanitizer down in a variety of methods, you're going to light it on fire. Now, you could start uh, pretty simply. Let's take John Smith, for example. And let's say that we are doing a spell of protection for John Smith. John Smith has been going through it, y'all. Uh, somebody put a, a bad snow day spell on him and he's having a really hard time and we don't know who did that. Um, so whoopsie. Uh, but we are wanting to do a, a spell of protection for John Smith. So we're going to put John Smith's name down here on a piece of paper. And then what we're going to do is just take our hand sanitizer and do a nice ring around the paper, making sure that it stays connected. Now, you can crumple it up, you can leave it. Just keep in mind, you are going to do this. You're going to light it on fire. And then this creates a pretty high temp uh, fire, but it burns pretty cleanly because of the alcohol in the hand sanitizer. So just let that burn down. It's going to burn out uh, all of the alcohol that's inside of the hand sanitizer um, and pretty much leave you with nothing. But we're using a circle of fiery protection. You've heard of fiery walls of protection. This is another way of accomplishing that. And you'll see that even though, I don't know if you can kind of tell on camera there, um, this is all on fire. Ooh. Um, this is all lit on fire, um, just like a sort of a sterno uh, underneath, um, you know, cooking like you're a buffet. But the paper is fine because it's not touching the alcohol. So anyways, uh, that would be the first way. So you could do a circle of protection. Uh, likewise, you could write... We're just going to let that burn down. You could write a word down. You could write someone's name, uh, say you want to um, uh, inspire passion in someone or say that you uh, want to burn someone up or burn someone, uh, burn an idea up, uh, get rid of something, have it consumed quickly and make it go away. Uh, it, it could be another banishing um, if you want. So you could, let's just say, we'll just go back to being sad. So sad, so sad. We're getting rid of all of our sad and burning it up in fire. Okay, so we are sad. I don't know if you can kind of see the flame still burning there. Um, but then we are going to say our words of power, we are going to sing, we are going to chant, we are going to do whatever other ritual things that we want to do, and then we're just going to light it on fire. <laughs> I did not get my magical name, ironically. We are going to set some things on fire is what we are going to do. So again, this is going to burn the alcohol cleanly out of the hand sanitizer and eventually what you're going to be left with is an aloe gel uh, or, you know, whatever the carrier is, uh, the carrier gel is for your hand sanitizer. Um, so again, we can ritually use something that we have on hand to make effective magic. Now, there's another way that we could do this. 
if you have something that cannot be consumed by fire, like a crystal, let's say that you want to uh, really energize the energy of that crystal. So say that we have uh, a rose quartz. So I'm using a rose quartz here, just a little piece of tumbled rose quartz that I've had for a million years. There you go. Um, and let's say that I want to uh, inspire passion uh, in either myself or someone that I really care about. Um, and, you know, I, I want to inspire passion in that person or myself. I can cover the rose quartz in a healthy amount of that gel. Speak my words of power, chant, sing, whatever else I want to do to add to the ritual. Again, the mechanics of the spell are not complicated. They are not hard. But then, again, we light it on fire. Maybe we continue chanting, we continue singing, we continue doing something to build up uh, that, that magic, that power as we continue to release it. But the mechanics of the spell still are, take your non-flammable object, a crystal, um, a piece of petrified wood, uh, something you know that isn't going to readily get consumed um, whenever the, the fire gets down, uh, but again, we are lighting it on fire. We are letting the energy of the fire ignite the energy that's inside that crystal, letting them work together, marrying those two elements and creating magic. So that is two and a half uh, different ways to use hand sanitizer in magic. There's a bunch of others. I'm sure you can think of uh, several others on your own, but here's a way that you can take what you have on hand and make some magic. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Uh, I hope that um, the, the rituals that I showed you, or at least the mechanics that I showed you, uh, inspire you to make some magic with stuff that you have on hand. Get resourceful, find out, you know, take uh, stuff that you have on hand and get creative, figure out new and interesting ways of making magic. Do not let the fact that you are missing an ingredient from the book stop you from doing effective spellcraft. If you like those spell canvases, you will probably probably like my book, The Dabbler's Guide to Witchcraft, which came out September 28th from Simon & Schuster and is now available everywhere books are sold. Uh, please ask for your local witchy shop to get it in stock. Um, and one lucky person here today at Chicago Pagan Pride is going to go away with a copy. So thank you all so much for being here. Uh, like I said, I've been Firelight. Um, you can get more of me. I am at Inciting a Riot on most forms of social media. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, um, and TikTok. <laughs> uh, you can also subscribe to my podcast, Inciting a Riot, anywhere you download shows. Thank you all so much for being here and uh, be well. <laughs>